This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook, and I am with the greatest woman entrepreneur I've been with in a really long time, and Cindy Eckert and Kim Perel, I'm sure, are turning in their villas somewhere. But uh, Sid Tetro reminds me of those two young, unbelievable women entrepreneurs that I put up there as icons for my three daughters for what they can aspire to be. Welcome, Sid Tetro, to The Playbook. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me, and thanks for that amazing intro. Well, you're amazing, and... You know, one of the things in my mission, and I have to say this quickly because people get sour face when I start and then when I finish, they smile. But one of the missions that I have as, you know, a dad of three daughters is to change one of the most inequities, inequities in history, which is less than 2% of our financial capital goes to women. Yep. Um, and it's probably worse now. And if you take out Stanford graduates, it's really, really low. It is Um, because they they don't care if you graduate Stanford, they don't care what you look like or who you are. Um, So I'm creating a fund for men only to fund women. That's awesome. So only men can put their money in because I I want the women to have their money to do what where they want to put it. But there's too many middle aged men like me that want to make this change. But no one's taking the forefront and saying, hey, this is about men doing what we want to do, meaning supporting the people that got us here and the people who have more talent than us. And we're going to display our radical humility uh, in that way. Now, you're a record setting money raiser. You've raised over a hundred million dollars. Your companies are all successful. You get every reward and (laughs) award and that's all given. But I don't care whether you're a man, a woman, tall or short, but there's a gift in raising money. It's a superpower of mine and it's a superpower of yours. What do you think some of the things are that if you know young people are looking within today saying, this is part of my makeup, my essence, that really make you such a capable money raiser? You know, when you're in this business and when you think about raising capital, at the end of the day, so much of it is based on trust and network. And that's really the core of it. When you go to put your money into someone, it's do you believe that person and do you believe that they will be a good steward and that the opportunity that they're pursuing is going to be able to crush it, whatever that means for someone. And so when you think about that, because everyone just thinks about it as I'm just going to go pitch an idea. If my idea is good enough, I'm going to get the money. But it's way more than that. And it really comes down to those skills that you have as a person. And I think that integrity that you have as a person to say, Not only do I believe in this idea and it's a great idea, but I'm also going to do everything possible for all of my stakeholders. And then you, I do believe that one of the things that, you know, related to the fund that you're creating for women that I think women have also not have as, has, have had as strong as men is related to um, their networks of power and the networks of capital. And I think that's one of the big things that we have to continue to disrupt in order to drive more capital towards women. What about practice? You know, you, are running an incredible company, brandless. You have a platform that I haven't seen with consumer products that enable companies to not only elevate their awareness, but also to elevate the revenue of the company along with the awareness. Um, I believe that we all have different skills and knowledge. Our skills and knowledge are the basement, but our potential is determined by the practice of our desire. And uh, within the context of practice, I always look at through my career successes and failures, but I've always been someone who is extremely consistent in the practice of my potential. Mm-hmm. Some of the potentials I picked were the wrong ones, like being yep. a professional football player and some <laughs> were the right ones, like being able to be an entrepreneur or raising yeah. money or a philanthropist of helping other people that are inherent in my skills and knowledge as a higher basement than other people have. How important is it even for you today to practice your skills of whatever it is in entrepreneurship or in fundraising in order to effectuate such a high level of success. I mean, I I agree with you. Everything comes down to your willingness to learn and your willingness to try because you're not going to bat a thousand. That's right. Like this is not possible. (laughs) And so it all comes down to this. Are you willing to like step up to the plate and take a swing every time, even when you get rejected? And the one thing we were just talking about fundraising, the one thing with fundraising is you're going to get rejected like 98% of the time. So you're going to stand in front of someone and they're going to tell you that you aren't going to get funded. And it requires a lot of discipline and a lot of practice 
in order to refine those skills. I've been kind of one of those people over the course of my career where I've seen gaps in places that I felt like I really needed strength in order to be to like build that career path that I wanted. And so I've sought those out and I've said, you know what? I don't, when I very first started fundraising, like actually I've never raised capital before. I should go learn this. So I'm one of my very first CEOs I went to him and I said, do you know what? I want to go on the road. I want to learn how to raise capital. And he opened that door for me. And I went on the road. We had previously raised like 58 million. We are doing our next round. And for me, it's that philosophy. It's not just practicing, but it's also seeing the places where you know you have gaps and being willing to learn, being willing to step in and then add that to your practice regimen. Because I promise you, every pitch I give is not right. Sometimes I walk out of those and I'm like, oh, I could have done so much better. But every time you learn something and that's what ultimately makes you better. I think it's that. And I think it's your authenticity in those moments of really like your conviction about what you're doing and your conviction about your ability to lead. And when we look at conviction in essence, your skills, knowledge and desire and the believability, the trust, as well as the confidence that others have in us, not only represented by who we are and what we've done and the people who have surrounded us, the people and the ideas, but I have found that the people most successful have a capability, whether it's learned, practiced, uh, or all of the above, to be able to take the last step that a lot of people can't take. And it's the ability to articulate the value. Uh, and if you can articulate a value to exceed what you're asking for, then you're in the golden round. But I know, and you have, being a technology leader like yourself, I've met geniuses. Mm -hmm. and they have companies that my mental capacity can barely wrap my uh, hands around. Yep. But yet when it comes to explaining it, they have no capability at all. And it's a waste of value because they don't have someone that can articulate that value. Uh, for you, how important is it that you have this clarity, balance and focus of value before you go out to either pitch your company, raise money, or retain or recruit employees, which to me, I spend the majority of my time yep. knowing where my value comes from. So I'm constantly trying to articulate the quantitative value of working with me mm -hmm. more than even my company. Yeah. I mean, I think that's for sure true because so much of who you are represents people's willingness to invest in you or work for you or be around that. I mean, I think it's at the, you know, the core of, of who we are. You spend a lot of time really trying to represent what your essence is in order, in order to bring those people in and really help them find value in the interactions with you. And you talked about rejection. And I think in any field that we have to have some sort of level of understanding and acceptance of rejection. Jack Canfield, who I wrote a book with, his first book, I think sold second to the Bible, half a billion copies, chicken soup for the soul. Yep. But he was rejected over 120 publishers, not only rejected him, but I think more importantly than the rejection is that so many people laughed at him, scoffed at him and made fun of him, which is inherent in the culture today, especially with the amplification yep. of who we are on social media, that we can really fall into a death spiral, a, a negative uh, slope uh, in resistance, how have you been able not only to deal with rejection, but I'm sure like me, many people have laughed at you, scoffed at you and made fun of you. And yet you continued on the trajectory of what you wanted in your life or better. So I think one of the things that always guides me is I'm always trying to do the things, not just for myself, but the people around me that make it better. This, I think there's this ability for this creative problem solving that's kind of innate in who I am that has become one of those guides. Like there's going to be a crisis every day. There's something you're going to have to solve. But for me, this combination of both that skill and then, you know, at the end of the day, I am trying to lift other people around me. And there are always going to be people who are not on the same side, right? You're never going to win everyone over. But you also are trying to be driven by this compass that says, I am trying to like help families and individuals and communities around me because when everyone maximizes their talents, everyone's better. And for me, that kind of drives like how I think about the world um, and how I think about the people who do come at you, right? Whether, you know, whether they want to attack or all of those other things. I have just this guiding principle that says like, I am trying to do the things that help all of those other people. And because of that, I actually think it's created a network of people around me that are also about lifting 
which I think has actually helped the amplification of those. But you're never going to get away from it. It's just not possible in today's world. And beyond that leadership, uh, there's so many different people that coach and train and speak about, write books about, have podcasts about leadership. And, uh, you know, just like authenticity, it seems to be overdone and overused. And we're sitting here at SoFi Stadium and I'm thinking about one of the young athletes that I work with, a gentleman named Austin Eckler, who was six on the depth chart and ended up being an all pro running back. And if you see him on the streets, most people don't recognize him uh, as being an unbelievable leader. Yep. And he is an unbelievable leader. You bring on an Austin Eckler type of energy here at SoFi because I can imagine walking uh, on the streets here in California and compared to when I walk with Tony Robbins or Elon Musk or, you know, these guys that people are like, oh, even Gary Vee, who's unassuming, right? But people recognize him, right? right? Um, what is a true leader to you? Does it have to have that component of you know, the recognition of, you know, being able to be stopped on the street as an entrepreneurial or a business leader, or does it have a different definition for you uh, in, to inspire other people to be a leader? Yeah, I mean, I really don't define leadership by, you know, that recognition side of it. I mean, some of that comes right as you are a CEO, but I'm not going to be recognized on the street. I totally get yeah. that, right? <laughs> but after this podcast, after you never this podcast, know. I'm like totally there. <laughs> And they go, oh my God, I saw you on Dave Meltzer's <laughs> podcast. Exactly. Okay, perfect. I'm watching for that. Um, but I'll you put you at the airport so then they'll recognize you. Okay, I'm going with you. The, um, when I think about leadership, for me, it's truly defined by your ability to inspire those people around you to maximize every potential that they have in those seats. Like your job as a leader is to create an organization where every person wants to show up, contributes everything that they can so that you can collectively achieve success. My personal barometer over the years has often become, you know, when I leave this company or I go to my next experience and some, and I have an opportunity to bring talent again, will people want to work for me again? Because for me, that represents, did I lean into the things that they could contribute? Did they give them a growth path? Did I recognize the skills that they're contributing? And I, did I build an organization where they could thrive? And I rely on that consistently. Like that's how I measure me as a leader. Did I do all of those things? Because at the end of the day, becoming a leader is no longer about yourself. That's the fundamental difference between individual contributors and leaders. Individual contributors, they get all the glory because they're finishing a project. But leaders, they don't. Leaders' jobs are to take all those resources around you and help them do the very best they possibly can in that situation. And when you do that, you did right by the company, the stakeholders, and the people who truly lift you up. And the last thing I want to bring to everyone's attention and looking through your history, bio, successes, brand lists, the variety of things that you've done previous with Disney, the list yeah. goes on and on. We podcasts are short here. If I was Rogan, I'd have time to give you all of your props. Um, but you seem to have a quality of listening for, you know, a lot of leaders or executives or entrepreneurs like yourself, they're really good at talking to people to inspire them, motivate them. And I see, an aspect or a capability that's very valuable in that as a leader, but you seem to have shifted a paradigm in your career that you're really more interested than interesting, which is one of my key lessons I try to empower people with. You know, what are some of the key components of listening for, not speaking to? So I'm gonna give you this really quick story. Please. Very early in my career, when I came out of my MBA program, I was a product manager at a networking company and my VP came to me and he said, Sid, you have to stop talking in meetings. And I was totally taken back, right? Because I'm yeah. like, I came out of grad school. I like know all of this stuff. <laughs> and it was this moment of reflection for me that was, you're right. I can either understand what he's telling me about how I'm being heard or not. And it, defi it was a defining moment for me where I stepped back and I said, you're right. I don't have to talk all the time. I can step back. And if I try to listen to where the other person's coming from, if I try to read that room, if I try to understand all of the dynamics at play, then when I respond, I'm actually doing so in a valuable way. I don't have to be right all the time. I don't have to say something all the time. What I have to do is be able to assess the situation in order to help us move forward and do so in a way. And for me, that has then become a thread through my entire career. How do I step back? How do I actually understand the situation? before I decide if anything I'm gonna say is helpful or not. Everyone doesn't have to solve a problem my way. We just have to get to the outcomes that are 
most beneficial for the situation. And if I can be the empowering leader that respects those people on the other side, we will accomplish far more than we ever can if it's just about me. Well, if it means anything, I see that in you. Oh, thank you. And it's not what we say, it's what we hear. And I hear you. We're blessed to hear Sid Tetro here with me today at the greatest stadium ever created. She's the new Austin Eckler at SoFi with me here, David Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.